Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to our Curious Amalgam. I'm John Roberti. We are the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law section, and we cover topics in antitrust, consumer protection, and privacy law. Today's topic is called, Is the Price Right? Understanding Vertical Price Restraints. Everybody has had the experience of going online and trying to find the best price. And sometimes when you look, you find that all the prices start to look the same. In antitrust, we worry about price fixing. And you wonder, why is it that all of these prices, products from the same manufacturer, are charged at the same level? But then you see other manufacturers charging at different levels. We want to try to understand how it can be that a manufacturer can influence the price that's ultimately sold to a consumer. My co-host today is Elise Dorsey. Hi, Elise. Hey, John. Elise, what do we have lined up today? Um, today we're going to be talking about the how we use the prices you see online and kind of how you how those prices come to be. So sometimes when you're shopping for a consumer product, you'll see different prices if you go to different stores, but sometimes you'll see the exact same price no matter where you're going. And sometimes you get in this weird situation where the retailer will be telling you you can't see the price at all unless you add an item to your cart and then they'll reveal what the price is. Um, so we're going to talk today about the antitrust laws kind of behind all of that. Uh, being the most frugal man in the world, I'm excited to hear how I can find out what the lowest prices are. <laughs> um, what what are we hoping to what are we hoping to accomplish today? Yeah, I think we're hoping to get, you know, kind of a better understanding of what you're seeing online, where it's coming from, and maybe if there are instances where you can find a better price or maybe if something else is affecting it and there's a reason and you can just stop looking. And who's our guest today? Our guest today is David Evans. He's a partner at Kelly Dry and Warren in DC and he's also the co-chair of the Antitrust Law Section Distribution and Franchising Committee. Dave, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is great. Awesome. So, David, you want to kind of just give us some background? John and I were kind of talking about examples that we could use. We thought about branded TVs or maybe grills. I brought up the example of um, I was looking for some designer shoes the other day. And I, I, I do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, John and I were both looking for designer shoes the other day. Um, we were looking at different department stores and seeing, you know, kind of the same price. And actually, one of the stores was having a sale. And it said, though, before I could see the price before John and I could see the price we'd have to add the shoes to our cart so i made john do it um Did but that. yeah so kind of talk to us about what it is that we're seeing where's that coming from who's making the pricing decisions sure with premium products like the, the handbag the louis vuitton handbag the rolex watch um manufacturers don't want to see a lot of discounting because they're premium products they can get a premium price um they do it through a, a mechanism called uh, resale price maintenance, where they basically tell their distributors the, min, uh, the minimum price they need to sell at. And um, if they can enforce it well enough uh, by terminating the deviating distributors, other things, uh, they can maintain higher prices and pretty much uniformly across it isn't spaces. David, is, David, isn't that price fixing? Well, it was. Um, in... Prior to 1997, uh, it used to be per se illegal, meaning that um, setting the minimum price or setting the maximum price was illegal, irrespective of the rationale. After 97, um, the minimum, uh, excuse me, maximum resale price maintenance, that's where you the manufacturer tells the distributor the maximum price they can sell at. Uh, that was evaluated under the um, rule of reason. Uh, the rule of reason is... Um, a balancing test. They look at pro-competitive things and anti-competitive things. And if the action is more anti-competitive, it's condemned. If, you, um, if you're the rule of reason, though, aren't you, and you don't have a big market share, aren't you usually pretty safe? Uh, for the most part, yes, um, nowadays. But that that's 
post 2007. Uh, prior to 2007, uh, it was per se illegal also. Uh, 2007, the Supreme Court said, you're going to do this test. Uh, and if you don't have market power under the rule of reason test, uh, you're, you're pretty much free. There are several states that after that 2007 case, uh, several states came out and said, uh, this is the worst idea ever. We're going to enforce the per se rule for minimum resale price maintenance. Uh, and uh, three of them, as far as I know right now, three of them actively enforced uh, New York. Uh, they they include California, um, Maryland, Kansas, and in the early days after Legion, New York. So if you're manufacturing, if your distribution relies heavily on those four areas, you're not going to want to have a resale price maintenance uh, plan because you could get into trouble with them. So let me get this straight. It used to that either setting the minimum or the maximum price used to be per se illegal, full stop. Mm -hmm. In 97, the maximum price started to be reviewed under the rule of reason, which is this balancing thing you talked about. Mm -hmm. And then after 2007, the minimum price had, was reviewed under the balancing thing under federal law. But even today, in some pretty big states yep. that it's still per se illegal. Right. Okay. I, I, I have clients, they don't like to violate state laws. How do, how do they, how do they do this without getting into trouble? Not that they do. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it really, it, when you're counseling a client, you gotta, you gotta ask them, um, do they really have a premium brand and are there, uh, is their distribution system diffuse enough such that they could terminate somebody who deviates? Um, if you have power buyer, power buyers, if you, uh, you depend on a, a major um, uh, reseller, somebody like Walmart, um, you're not going to be able to impose a higher price on them. They're just going to they're going to price at whatever price they want. So, David, when the courts started to reevaluate and moved away from the per se rule, what were the justifications for that? They must have thought something good was going on if they thought it might be OK to have these kinds of restrictions on pricing. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the major issues are free riders. And they came up with they they, they came around with the uh, the Internet, basically. So you'd have a bricks and mortar store that had invested a lot in facilities and training their training their folks and people would go into the store and see a pair of shoes for $110. Um, and then they, uh, go back to their internet, uh, their computer and buy it from some internet discounter for $80. The store had made this huge investment in the brand, but the consumer and the, uh, the, uh, internet discounter made no investment, but the internet discounter got the sale. So the support was not the, the price support was not there for the, uh, the retailer. And, um, it created a very uh, it created a disbalance in the market because you'd, you'd basically have these retailers investing huge amounts of money and then losing all these sales. <clears throat> so that's so that's what the Supreme Court was. That's why the Supreme Court said it was no longer full stop illegal. They wanted to let people to look into this free rider issue, as you say. I think that's part of it. They didn't address that specifically, but. Um, uh, I, I think the goal of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court's been moving away from the per se rule for a long time. Um, Khan was one of the major steps, and now now they applied it to uh, um, <clears throat> um, max minimum resale price maintenance. Excuse me. Uh, I think the idea is that uh, a, a rule of reason analysis takes a more fulsome look at activity, and uh, particularly in a vertical situation where a supplier will be disciplined if there's plenty of competition. Um, they want to make sure that uh, they're not uh, foreclosing activity that would otherwise be good. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess to go back to your example, like if I went into Best Buy and I wanted to test out some headphones mm -hmm. um, and I use their products and got to talk to their salespeople and then didn't buy anything at Best Buy, but went online and say bought it from a discount seller online, um, you know, they're able to charge me less because they don't have a brick and mortar store. They're not investing in, you know, having the salespeople who are knowledgeable and having actual equipment there that I can use. And right. I think what, you know, I'm hearing is that some of that like might be good and something that the price maintenance schemes kind of help to support and foster in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, are there drawbacks to these kinds of price maintenance? That what do we tend to balance when we talk about what the courts are doing under the rule of reason? 
Sure. So like for California, um, <clears throat> they just don't believe in the free rider problem. They think that uh, uh, consumers benefit from uh, vertical competition. They think that uh, the savings that uh, uh, a consumer could enjoy from that competition is worth a lot more than whatever uh, premium the, uh, the manufacturer might be able to extract by virtue of his, uh, his investment. Dave, Dave, what are some of the ways today that companies try to avoid um, issues with sure. enforcers? So I, I've actually seen explicit uh, vertical price fixing agreements where the manufacturer says, um, <clears throat> uh, you distributor must price at the price list or we're going to terminate you. Or they even have graduated uh, punishments, first First, first punishment is um, a slap on the wrist. Second is terminating this product. Third is terminating all products uh, for the year. And then fourth is just we're not going to deal with you. Um, I've also seen uh, MAP plans. These are uh, man- uh, minimum advertised pricing plans. But uh, clients will clients will use the term MAP plan to mean a whole variety of things. So you really want to sit down and chat with them about what they're, what they're really thinking about when they say MAP plans. But, but it sounds like those vertical pricing agreements, that would be a problem in California, wouldn't it? They absolutely would be. And uh, a lot of, a lot of practitioners say, don't, you know, don't go there, but um, they feel that the risk, uh, the, the clients feel that the risk is, is manageable. Um but we do tell them that there there are these states that have problems with that, and they should really think seriously about it. So, tell me a little bit more about this this map policy thing. You said minimum advertising price. Sure. How how, how is that like uh, fixing the final price? That sounds different. Yeah, it is. It is. So these came up um, pre ninety seven when it was per se illegal, and it stands for minimum advertised pricing plan. Uh, yeah, that's it. And. Um, uh, what happens is a manufacturer will say to its distributor, I will pay for your advertising. If you advertise at my suggested retail price or above, you're free to price at whatever you want to your customer and you're free to advertise at whatever level you want, but we're not going to pay for that advertising. And over the years, post Legion, these things have added, um, they have uh, discipline. Like I mentioned earlier, they have some, dis- they have graduated discipline that used to be illegal. Um, they can have, uh, uh, temporal components where you you have to price premium in season, but then off season you can discount. Um, there are very a variety of different ways of of uh, tweaking a map plan. Um, I tend to refer to them as uh, hybrid map plans, but they're uh, um, that's that's certainly one one option. What what about what about if um, if, if the con- is there something that have about a policy that the the manufacturer could do to to try to avoid this? Oh, sure. So a long time ago, there was a Supreme Court case called uh, um, Colgate. Uh, Colgate involved a manufacturer uh, with a price list and telling its distributors they're free to price at whatever price they want. uh, But if they price below any of the prices on the price list, they will uh, uh, immediately terminate them as a distributor. Uh, This went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said... um, well, that's not illegal because it's unilateral conduct. Uh, Section one requires an agreement, and the Supreme Court said there's no agreement here. Of course, you can have agreement um, through through performance, meaning that if you if you start working on the contract, that signifies you agree. Uh, but the Supreme Court didn't really care about that. So, but that uh, because it's not uh, because this unilateral termination is not captured by section one. Um, it's still valid because it doesn't matter if it, 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 if you're not in section one, it doesn't matter if it's per se or rule of reason. So you can impose one of these plans today and not worry at all about uh, the Sherman act or the state, uh, the state, um, the state uh, laws either. Okay. Well, I can imagine a client who might say something like this to you, Dave, look, I'm not really that interested in being investigated by the attorney generals of Maryland, California, and Kansas. And we want to ship products there. Right. This Colgate thing that you're describing to me, I'm not really that excited about terminating my best distributor if they make a mistake. Yeah. Can I, if they make that mistake and they charge below the price, can I just call them and say, look, don't do it ever again? And if they say, okay, I agree never to do it again, we're all good. Is that okay? Hmm. Uh, 
in the old days, uh, no, because that would be uh, viewed as an agreement. You're cajoling them or you're uh, berating them into following. Uh, you really had to terminate them whole, whole, whole cloth. Um, and one of the pieces of advice I would give uh, clients is uh, if you have a if you have a strong strong buyer in your chain, your distribution chain, uh, you're not going to want to turn it, terminate them, and it's going to be a very difficult situation if they start. Uh, discounting because your other distributors uh, will will see that and they will start discounting and then everybody will be discounting. And then if you don't terminate everybody, then you, you basically failed at your Colgate plant. So it's a big problem. What about this thing that Elise was talking about where I had to take my designer shoes and put them into the cart before I could see the price? Yeah. So that um, that's a way of allowing powerful distributors uh, or really any distributor to sell your product at a, at a discount without undermining um, your premium uh, without completely undermining your premium brand. So one, one, one issue for distributors are these discount um, uh, discount websites and if, uh, and Google, frankly. So if somebody Googles Louis Vuitton purse and they see a list of products and the first three are at, uh, you know, 75 99 and then the next three are at, uh, 200, you know, $300, you're going to, you're going to click on the, on the discounter. And it's perfect. In my view, it's perfectly reasonable for a manufacturer to want to limit, uh, uh, it, with a premium brand to want to limit the uh, ability of those internet discounters to, uh, undermine your, 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 your brand value. And one way of doing that without going full, um, resale price, price maintenance is to say, uh, if you discount, you can't display it on any website that's readable by a spider or, um, uh, a search engine. Um, and one way to accomplish that is to do it through a dynamic, um, shopping cart where somebody adds it to their cart. And then you, you go to your cart and you look at the URL and it's some 8,000 letter, um, and number URL, those, those search engine engines find it very hard to find those. So that minimizes, um, <clears throat> It minimizes the exposure to the search engines, and it also uh, allows them to discount. And those kinds of restrictions, do they tend to come up in actual agreements, or is that a result of like the retailer maybe trying to comply with a Colgate-style policy? Yeah, I've seen them both. both. Uh, I've seen, um, as part of a hybrid map plan, I've seen uh, those requirements imposed. Uh, I can also see... Um, a, a, a distributor wanting to adopt that because they believe in the premium brand and they want to support the is so you talked about this minimized advertising price policy thing the map thing um is displaying a price on an internet site is that advertising uh, it certainly could be thought of advertising. I mean, some, someone is looking at the price, uh, they're not in the physical store, but that is the physical store for the internet retailer. Uh, I've taken the position that it is type of advertising and it can be part of a map plan. Um, I don't think it's been litigated, but, uh, uh, when yeah. we lived in a world of brick and mortar, you would walk into a store and, there would be, there'd be interesting lines, right? Cause you can imagine having a display that a big sign that says price below map, that could be a problem. But if you had to go and pick up the item and look at the price tag and the price, it, nothing was on there other than the price tag on the product. I think it prob most people probably would think it wouldn't be advertising. So in an internet world, I think the question is probably are my de designer shoes and my designer handbag, is that the price tag or is that the display at the end of the aisle? I mean, isn't that more or less the question that we're that I guess has never really been confronted in the internet world? I I don't think it has. Um, I think the general view is that uh, the very first price you see when you land on a product page is more like the price at the uh, on the display at the end of the aisle. But when you get in and get it into the uh, uh, shopping cart, that's the price you see on the on the actual good. But I can't tell you that there's a rationale for that that you know, stands the test of time. Yeah. And if some of it, like you were talking about, is optimized and shows up like on Google search, then maybe that, even if the retailer isn't intending it to be like advertising, maybe makes it more like advertising in some ways. Because it's, you know, you don't even have to be necessarily on the retailer's page to see what that price is. Yeah. So, David, could you give us some tips 
on a, a, a again a, a a a retailer or a, a manufacturer that doesn't particularly want to be investigated by the state attorney generals right how can you set what what's what are some best practices uh to try to avoid that so i think um these hybrid map plans even though they would be in the old days would violate the federal um prohibitions against uh minimum resale price maintenance are fairly well uh they're being used a lot now and i've not heard of um even those states going after these hybrid map pl- plans, even though they have some of the indicia of, of Colgate, what would violate Colgate. Um, so I would say consider that. Um, but having said that, if you have significant sales in any of those four states, you want to think through that pretty closely because um, uh, an attack from the you know, California AG is going to be very costly to your business. And it, and then frankly, you also have to evaluate the economics of your product. Is it really a true, is it truly a premium brand? Is it, or are you just barking, you're just picking up some, some problems for yourself. And then also the distribution question you raised earlier, do you have powerful distributors who are not going to pay any attention to your plan and undermine the whole, you know, whole, the whole thing? Well, David, it's pretty clear you're very interested in all of this. Um, so we'd like to hear a little bit more about like what it is that you love about antitrust. It's really interesting. I mean, uh, you get to learn a whole brand new business um, and really get an, into a huge amount of details about it. Um, these matters are also uh, usually quite important to the company. So you get to talk to uh, really very powerful uh, people in industry. Uh, it's typically big companies, big successful companies that get into problems with antitrust. So um, I enjoy that a lot. Um, and so what advice would you have for younger people, attorneys, economists, just starting out? Join the section. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Become a uh, young lawyer division rep. No, seriously, I think that's a great, a, a great idea because you get to meet uh, the people who truly love antitrust and, uh, they will give you opportunities to learn more within the section. Um, and that will enhance your, your professional career. We're a small bar and, uh, our section represents a large portion of it. And you're going to be bumping up against these folks, uh, in deals and litigation for years and seeing them in the context, in the social context of the section is, is, is fun. It's fun for one thing. You become friends with folks and it really, I think, enhances your, uh, your professional career and your professional enjoyment out of, out of things. Yeah. Like if I couldn't stand John, uh, I probably would find this absolutely <laughs> horrifying, but it's, it's really quite fun. Just mildly horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, the thing that's, that's really nice, Dave is, is that um, I think your answer just got us um, re-upped for the next, <laughs> for the next si- season when we go back to the antitrust law section and ask us if they'll continue to support what we're doing. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. And also speaking, you know, about the social aspects, I think um, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you personally. So can you tell us something unusual or something maybe just that people who only know you professionally might not know? Um, I worked my way through law school as a uh, rodeo clown. Um, rodeo clown. That is totally not true. <laughs> no, it has to be. It has to be something that's actually true. That doesn't count. <laughs> you don't think I was a rodeo clown? <laughs> We're gonna need some pictures. You had me there, actually. But um, so uh, I know uh, how to write in Suderland script. Suderland script is a uh, cursive handwriting that was taught German students from 1915 to 1941. Um, I also don't speak a lick of German. Um, my father taught it to me for some reason, and I remember it. I still don't believe you. <laughs> well, I can do that. I'll prove it. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, this is a podcast, and people can't yes. re- see you writing in, in Pseudoland script. But maybe that, we can get some on the website after. Actually, maybe we can take a picture of that and yeah. put it up and post on the website, uh, the uh, Pseudoland script. Well, I think we have clearly uh, run out of things to talk about today. So um, <laughs> it's time for our final segment, which we call The Curious Hat. And now it's time for The Curious Hat. So uh, The Curious Hat is the final segment. We have an actual hat that has questions on the index cards. And we're going to ask Dave to pick a question. Okay, question number four. What is your favorite band and why? 
My favorite band, and this is going to be extraordinarily embarrassing, is uh, a, a, an 80s goth band called The Cure. Um, I just, I, I like the... I like the sound. Uh, I like the topics that uh, Robert Smith sings about. Um, they're fun in concert, and for some bizarre reason, I just adore their music. So, what what was the last time you saw the Cure in concert? I saw them play at the Rock Hall when they were inducted. I wasn't physically there, but I saw it on TV. Does that count, or do I? How about live, live. You know. After Blood Flowers, they sort of just sucked, and I stopped going. But um, yet, they're your favorite band. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question: Do you own a Cure concert T-shirt? I do not. Okay. Something for your birthday. <laughs> and with that, that is another episode of our Curious Amalgam. Thanks everybody for listening, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of our Curious Amalgam. A competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.org. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.